Hello everyone, welcome back. This is a new lecture in your course Linux for Absolute Beginners by Ionix. My name is Ahmed and in this lecture we are going to start by discussing why and possibly why not choose Linux. Now before we start our discussion, I assume that because you are taking this course, you probably are interested in using Linux as your primary or your secondary operating system. So why would you need to know why not to use Linux? Probably this part of the lecture should be about why choose Linux, why is Linux better than other operating systems. However, I would like you to make an educated decision when you want to use Linux. I want you to be totally convinced that Linux is the correct operating system for your task and that Linux is the one that you should use for this type of job. After all, you are not obliged to use Linux as your primary and only operating system because you can always use Linux side by side with other operating systems or you can use a virtual box like I'm using here. I'm using here a virtual box, which is one type of virtualization software. I'm using it to install Ubuntu on my Mac OS X machine and run it. As you can see here, I can run it in windowed mode or in full screen mode. And I can do everything with that operating system as if I'm installing it on the machine itself, not in a virtualized environment. You can use VirtualBox that is free to download and use to install any variant of Linux and see for yourself if it is the right operating system for the job at hand or not. That being said, let's start our comparison for Linux with the three most popular operating systems nowadays, which are Unix, Mac OS X, and Microsoft Windows. Let's start by Unix. Unix is an operating system that was developed in 1969 at AT&T Labs. It was and still an expensive, hard to get piece of software, especially for students with limited budgets. So back then, one talented student called Linus Torvalds decided that there should be some other alternative for using Unix and that alternative should be cheap or free of charge. So he decided to create a kernel that mimics all the features that a typical Unix installation has. So he worked on a kernel and it has been called Linux after his name and this evolved to Linux as we know it today because after creating it some other developers had a look at the source code and they started modifying it, started to add their own additions. Hundreds and hundreds of developers contributed to this kernel until it became what it is known now as the Linux kernel. And because the kernel of the operating system is not everything in an operating system, the, the, the kernel, as mentioned before, is just a program that acts as an interface between the program and the operating system, and also between the program and the hardware. And as mentioned, users cannot access the kernel. They cannot use the kernel directly. They have to use some other program, and with it, they can access the kernel. So that being said, the, op the operating system consists of the kernel and, and some other programs that help users interface with the operating system, that help users get their jobs done. So Linus Torvalds created the kernel, the kernel evolved, but without programs, it cannot be considered a complete operating system. So that was the role of the Free Software Foundation. They created the Gino project. Gino is short for Gino, not Unix. This is one of the recursive names that when you try to look it up, you will see that the abbreviation is mentioned again in the name. So Gino is Gino, not Unix. It aimed at providing free open source alternatives to proprietary programs that Unix used, for example, the shell. And the shell is one of the most important programs that any operating system has to provide. For example, if you open Windows, if you're a Windows user, and you have a look at the desktop, you see files and folders. When you double click on any folder, it opens its contents, whether it was files or other folders. If you double click on one of, the other, of those other folders, it will open its contents accordingly and so on. This functionality is provided to you by a program called Explorer.exe. This is the Windows shell. This is the program that is responsible for making you, as a user, interact and talk to the operating system. In Unix, this program is called the shell, and Unix systems contain a program called the Born shell, which is the, one of the most popular shells that have been used with Unix. So the Geno project created a free alternative for this proprietary shell, and called it the born again shell or for in short bash. If we have a look here at our Ubuntu system, this is bash. This the black screen that I'm writing code into is the shell. It is called bash and it is what accepts 
programs from me and transfer them to the operating system or to the kernel in order to get executed. Other programs are being provided like this program that, I'm, that I've just used, LS. LS is one of the programs that get shipped with the operating system itself. And again, it was one of the proprietary programs provided by or that shipped with Unix. And again, the Gino project created its own version of LS and shipped it with all Linux variants. So now that I have Linux and I have Unix, and as we can see, both are very, very similar to each other. Linus Torvalds created the kernel and the Free Software Foundation created the Gino programs. So what is the difference? Well, let's see where Linux excels in this comparison. Because of its popularity, Linux supports a variety of hardware combinations that Unix doesn't, provided that we are talking about laptops and PCs. Now, Unix is originally designed to work on servers. A server is just a large computer that is aimed at being able to run multiple programs for multiple users at the same time. And Linux can also be used as a server, and actually it is being used as a server in many situations and in many enterprises, but Unix is more suited towards this sort of work. Linux sometimes can be used as a server, some other times as a personal operating system on a laptop or on a personal PC. So for that reason, you're going to find that Linux provides a much wider array of hardware and it has a larger set of drivers that can accommodate for nearly every hardware that is available, either old or new. On the opposite, Unix does not have this generous support for hardware because after all, and as we said, Unix will be installed on a server and servers have their own set of hardware. They have their own set of server class hardware that is definitely supported by the Unix system. So if your job is just to use a personal computer or a laptop and you want to use something that is Unix-like, you'll be better off using Linux than using Unix. However, on the other hand, Linux falls short in that some Unix variants provide features that are not available to Linux, like for example, the ZFS file system, which is short for the Zettabyte file system. Now, file systems are going to be covered later in this course, but let's say for now that a file system is just a way that the operating system organizes your files and folders on the disk. It is a way by which the operating system allocates the space on your disk and provides you with files and folders and also let you manipulate them by creating, editing them, deleting them, changing their permissions, and so on. So the Zettabyte file system is one of the most powerful file systems available. It is much powerful than most other file systems that are used, like, for example, the ext3 or the ext4 used by Linux. But this file system is a proprietary one, and it is used by Oracle Solaris. It cannot be ported to Linux for copyright and license reasons. Another thing is that because Unix is a proprietary system, it can be run and sometimes must be run on proprietary hardware. So let's have an example, IBM's AIX. This is a very famous operating system created by IBM, it's called AIX, and it must be run on an IBM machine, namely the power machine. You cannot run AIX on any other machine other than the one created by IBM. So that way you have the same vendor that created the hardware is the one that is supplying you with the software. This is an advantage if you are in a large enterprise environment because in such environments when you have a mission critical application that must work 24 by 7 and you do not tolerate the smallest downtime window, Having the same vendor providing you with the software and the hardware of the machine that runs your application will ensure that when anything wrong happens, you can open a ticket with the vendor and the vendor will be responsible for both the hardware and the software. He will just get the job done for you. He will just solve the problem in the least possible downtime. However, if you are having a software from a vendor and the hardware from another vendor, then you may be bouncing sometime between both vendors. The software might tell you that the problem is not in the software and that you have to consult the hardware vendor and the hardware vendor tells you the same thing that the problem is not hardware based it is something in the software or, the, or in the application and this of course will cost you time and money so if you are in a large enterprise environment and your application is absolutely mission critical you are better off running on some commercial Unix version than Linux however if you are a medium-sized enterprise or if the application you're trying to run is not that mission critical and you can afford some downtime window, you can save yourself some money and go for a Linux distribution. You can use one of the paid ones, for example, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. They do provide support and updates in return for a subscription fee. Now let's have Linux compared to Mac OS X. The OS X is a commercial OS developed by Apple. It mimics a lot of Unix features and programs, namely from BSD. It is a Unix-like operating system. However, Apple has developed its own graphical user interface. So Apple interface, the Apple GUI, is not like 
Linux, nor is it like any of the Unix variants because it has been developed specifically by Apple for the OS X. And because of its reliance on Unix, you will find many Linux commands available on OS X. So for example, here is my terminal. This is a Mac OS X system. This is the system that I'm currently running on. And if I type ls here, which is the same command that I typed on my Ubuntu system, and it listed the files currently in my working directory, if I type ls and press enter, it will give me the very same output. It is listing the files and directories contained in my current directory. So we'll find that most of the commands that run on Linux or Unix were equally run on Mac OS X. So this makes the transition very easy for you if you are a Linux user and you want to move to Mac OS X or if you are a Mac OS X user and you want to move on to Linux, you will see that the transition is not that difficult because most of the commands are just the same. Now, where does Linux excel here? Linux may have a lot in common with OS X in terms of programs and user interface, but OS X cannot be run on any non-Apple computer as per the license terms. So if you want to try and run the Mac OS X on any other Intel-based machine other than Apple devices, this will not only break the license and is an illegal action, but also it is a hassle and it is not as easy as it seems. You will run into many problems before you can successfully run the Mac OS X on any machine other than Apple Mac. And of course, you're going to lose the license. You will not have any support from Apple if you did this. So this is one of the shortcomings of running Mac OS X and Linux, of course, excels at that point because you, can, because you can run Linux on any machine without breaking any license. But on the other hand, Linux falls short here is that Linux is provided as is. So unless you use a commercially supported variant like Red Hat Enterprise Linux or SUSE, the free support you're going to get will be much less reliable, usually through forums. And now I have to make a very important note about support, which is that although non-commercial Linux and by non-commercial, I mean those distributions of Linux that, that do, do, do not require you to pay a fee to get support and updates. Those distributions, although you will not find support on contract-based, however, if you go online and visit the forums, you will find plenty of support. There are literally hundreds or thousands, maybe millions of users that are voluntarily willing to provide help for most of the problems that you might encounter while using Linux. However, again, if you're working in an enterprise environment, you may want to opt for a contract-based support. You may want to opt for a paid support so that you have some sort of obligation when something goes wrong, somebody will be obliged to get things done, not just voluntarily offering to help. So this makes Linux free distributions a less attractive option if you are in an enterprise environment that require you to have paid support. Finally, let's have a comparison between Linux and Windows. And Windows, of course, is one of the most popular operating systems around in personal computer world, if it is not the most popular one already. It has been created and licensed by Microsoft. You can use it on any Intel-based computer, so you are not obliged to use a specific hardware. And of course, this is one of the strength point of Windows. Linux shares with Windows the vast support for different hardware, so this makes it ideal for personal computers. Again, Windows has a vast and generous support for most of the hardware peripherals that are installed with personal computers and laptops. The strength point of Linux here is that not only is it free, but also the large bundle of software that ships with it is free as well. If you have a look here at our Ubuntu example system, you'll see that this is, this is just a fresh installation of Ubuntu. I have not installed any software at all. This is just a fresh installation. And despite that, you will see that here are some programs that got pre-installed. This is the writer and this provides just the same functionality that is provided by Microsoft Word. You can see here also LibreOffice Calc which will provide a similar functionality like the one provided by Microsoft Excel and finally we also have LibreOffice Impress which will provide you with a presentation like application. It will give you the same functionality or a similar functionality like the one provided by Microsoft PowerPoint. Now all these programs are free all these programs are licensed under the, the GNU license. You do not have to pay anything in order to use these programs. However, on the other hand, if you're using Windows, if you want to use Office, you'll have to pay for that. You'll have to pay for the license. In addition to the license, you'll have to pay for Windows. So this is one of the strength points of Linux when it is compared with Windows. On the other hand, and despite the increasing number of users and PCs running some version of Linux as their primary operating system, the software vendors are still more inclined towards developing programs that only work on Windows. So if you are working, for example, on 
a mail program on Linux, you'll find that you have Thunderbird, you have, you have Evolution, and there may be plenty of other programs that will give you an email client. However, if you want to use the calendar feature of Outlook, for example, you'll, you'll not find Thunderbird or Evolution having this functionality. If you want it, you have to use Windows and you have to use Outlook. But if it is not strictly required, you will find that Thunderbird or Evolution provides you with the most common needs that any mail client should provide. Another thing is that hardcore gamers, if you're a gamer, if you like games, you'll find that most of the popular games are meant to be only installed on Windows. You will not see any of the popular games with a Linux version. So if you are a hardcore gamer, you'll find that this might be a point of weakness in Linux. However, if you are using Linux for business, I don't think that this might be a problem. And after all, and as we said previously, you can install Linux as a virtual machine or you can install it side by side with your original operating system, whether it was Windows or Mac OS X. And in the coming lecture, we are going to have a look at different Linux distributions, so stay tuned.